Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Locke. Welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, we're going to be having a look at the Nanlite Forza 60C. All right, so I only have this unit for a couple of days. So I don't have enough time to do the thorough amount of testing that I usually do. But I'll definitely be giving you enough information for you to decide if this unit is worth you purchasing. Now, this unit has taken a priority uh, over the 720s, which I was going to review today, because I think this unit represents a substantial change in, uh, or a substantial pivot point in lighting technology. It is not just a bigger unit or better built unit like the 720s are. This is substantially different. So this is their full color unit, but instead of being an RGBWW light, this light uses red, green, blue, amber, lime, and cyan to generate all of its colors. So let's take a look at the pros. All right, so before we get into the first pro, I'm just gonna explain how this unit works. So the light engine is actually sitting right back here uh, on the heatsink. And in order to get the light forwards um, into the mount area, the LEDs are sitting inside a mirrored reflector. And that punches the light forwards onto this diffuse surface here. So this surface here is uh, essentially trying to give you one single point light source, which enables the light to work with hard light modifiers and give you good shadow qualities. Now, this has the advantage of intensifying the light beam. So that's the first pro is how bright this is. This is actually brighter than the bicolor version. So this is full color gamut and brighter than bicolor. That, that sort of blows my mind to start with. But it does have uh, one uh, you know, possible disadvantage, and that is the beam angle uh, isn't as wide. And we'll talk about why that's uh, a bit of a disadvantage later on, and it is to do with the optical accessories. If I was to take a guess at the beam angle on this, I would say it's a somewhere around 90 degrees, but that's just a guess. I can't find any uh, printed information on the beam angle. The next plus is the CCT mode or the white light mode. Because of all of the color emitters that this thing has, it has an extended CCT range. At the moment, it's running at its top Kelvin of 20,000 Kelvin, and it'll work all the way down to 1,800 Kelvin. Now with that Kelvin range, it does take quite a bit of twisting on the knob to go from one end to the other. Now here's the thing, not only does it have this huge CCT range, but it also has a full plus minus green. So you can add 100 increments of plus green or 100 increments of magenta to match to your location lighting. Now it also tracks the Planckian curve. And despite not having white color emitters, it has some very impressive TN30 color vector scores. Even right down at 2000 Kelvin, it comes in at 91% color render. Now the next plus for this unit is the additional amber, cyan, and lime color emitters give this thing an increased color gamut. Now a lot of people get color gamut mixed up with color render. They are two completely different things. Color render refers to how accurately a light might reproduce my skin tones or the color of my shirt in its CCT mode, whereas color gamut refers to the colors that the light can generate itself. So let's have a look at the color gamut. So I'm just gonna scroll through. So we get some very, uh, very saturated colors that you don't normally get out of an RGB light. So one good example is yellow. So let's see if we can uh, scroll through to yellow. If you've ever tried to generate yellow out of a RGB light, you'll know that it's very hard to do. All right, so we're almost getting to the yellows. That's amber. And there we go, that's yellow. So here's the next positive in this mode. Not only does it have increased color, but it is very powerful. So in these photos here, I have the light sitting in my driveway with no modifier on it. And I've turned the house lights on so you get some idea of how bright this is. I'm not just doing an extended shutter, for example. Now it blows my mind that this light with no modifier on it can deliver this sort of firepower in full saturated colors. Now here I'm using the light with the projector mount coming in from outside. I'm using it about seven meters away from the window to try and get an even distribution of light level across the wall. Now here I'm using the light with the projector mount to get fine controlled colored lighting. That brings me to my next point. The light already has optical accessories that are available for it, such as the projection mount and the Fresnel that I have here. This Fresnel sells for under 100 Australian dollars.
and the project amount here sells for about 430 Australian dollars. So I'm guessing that's around maybe 350 US. Now the next Pro is a big one for professional users. The light has a DMX port. You will need a DMX cable to plug into it though. Now here's the pluses. It actually has really good DMX profiles. It has your typical standalone profiles like CCT and HSI, which are available in 8 and 16 bit, but it also has crossover modes like CCT RGB and CCT HSI. So for example, in the CCT HSI mode, you can dial in a Kelvin, dial in a plus minus green value, and then cross over a color hue. It even has 8 and 16 bit XY coordinate modes and also an ultimate mode. Now the DMX is pretty good. If you're doing fast fades, for example, it is very smooth. But if you're doing a transition that's say longer than two seconds, it can be a bit steppy. Now I've left the biggest pro until last. Despite all the professional features, this light sells for a prosumer price point of 700 US dollars. That's about 900 Australian dollars. And you actually get so much for that that I can't figure out how to get it all back into the bag. So what I'd suggest when you buy it is take a photo so you can figure out how to get it all back in. All right, so let's have a look at what we get. So you get the light, of course, which is very well built. You get a reflector dish. So this is a 45 degree dish. Now this dish is very differently built to the dishes on the other 60s. And I suspect that's because the light has a very narrow beam. All right, so it's um, very reminiscent of the new reflectors that are on the Nanlux Evokes. The good thing with these reflectors is when you get further than two and a half meters away from the light, you get very good shadows. Next thing in the kit is this little weird battery handle. So the light mounts to the top here and you connect the uh, power into the back of the light. Now it runs off two MPF batteries. So I'm not gonna be using this because I don't have any MPF batteries. Now, if you wanna mount this to a light stand, a light stand will mount through here. We get a cap for the COB area. We get a regional power cable. We get the instruction books. You get a power supply, which has a V mount. And you get a Bowen mount adapter. So the reason you get a Bowen mount adapter is the light is actually physically smaller than a Bowen mount. All right, so you can use the Bowen mount adapter for any existing soft boxes that you have, things like that. And the Bowen mount also has an umbrella mount on it as well. Now, before we go on, I'm just going to explain how I will be running these off batteries. So I'm going to use a four pin to DTAP adapter. Then I've got a uh, four pin to DC cable, which I just found uh, somewhere on eBay. And that's what I'm going to be using to run the system. Now, I reckon if you had a good hunt around, you could probably find a one cable solution. But yeah, I sort of lost patience with that. All right, so we've gone through all the pros. Let's go through some of the negatives now. And the first negative I have is to do with the XY mode, especially with the phone app, or at least with the phone app in the Android version. Now this light has an extended color gamut because of all of its extra color emitters. The software engineers cut and pasted the RGB color gamut map from the previous lights. Now, in addition to this, the app and the light seem to be running in different color spaces. So the phone app looks like it's got a color gamut that's in excess of say a Rec 2020, but the light seems to be running in a Rec 709. So what I mean by that is if you try to dial in a full saturated color like this, you're actually gonna get something like this. Now at the moment, if you wanna run the light in the XY mode over DMX, the DMX mapping information is not available yet. Now the next negative is to do with how the light works through the projector mount. Now the projector mount was designed for the monocolor and the bicolor light. This full color version doesn't have as wide a beam and that affects the evenness. So as you can see here, there is a lot of drop off on the edge of the beam. And this can really come into play if you're trying to do a cut from edge to edge. However, the bulk of this drop off area is outside the safe zone on your gobos. So it might be a minimal issue for you, but it is worth knowing that it's there. Also, the focus on the projections is not as even throughout the beam as it was with the monocolor and the bicolor light. However, from a distance of about a meter away, I don't think you can see it. 
And because a lot of this focus issue is to do a chromatic aberration or color fraying, it's not obvious when you're doing color projections. Because you've got a limited amount of spectrum, you get limited color fraying. So if you're projecting full saturated colors, you get incredibly sharp shadows. Now the next negative is to do with the consistency of your white light across the beam, particularly if you're using the projector mount or the Fresnel. Now it's quite unusual that you're gonna come across this problem and most people probably wouldn't even spot it when it shows up. So let me just explain what's going on. So with a monocolor COB, all of this is the same color. So you've got the same color light going through the entire beam in the projection mount, assuming you don't get things like chromatic aberration, for example, or color frame. If this was bicolor, you'd have an even spread of warm white and cool white. Now this thing is using red, green, blue, lime, amber, and cyan all mixed together. So there's six emitters. Now the problem is you don't get a perfectly even color distribution across the surface here with those colors, depending on what Kelvin you've got dialed in. Now this really shows up on the projection mount at 5,600 Kelvin if you're within about a meter and a half of the subject. Now if I go over this beam here with a spectrometer, there's a difference of about 200 Kelvin from one section to another section. And there's a huge shift to roughly the equivalent of a 16th correction gel. Now if you're projecting say two or three meters, everything seems to merge together and it's less noticeable. Now where this can really show up is with the Fresnel. If you've got the barn doors really compacted in. Now closing up the barn doors really fine can make the light act like a reverse pinhole camera or to be more to the point, a pinhole projector. In the old days, you could even see the globe inside the Fresnel lights. Now, if you have a close look at the beam here, you can see that this section is slightly magenta, and this section is slightly green. Now, if you're not using the barn doors tightly boxed, this is never gonna be an issue. Now, just to make sure I'm being perfectly clear here, if you were to use the light with its reflector or with no modifier at all as a floodlight, you get perfectly even color distribution, even in color modes. And with no modifier on, the shadows are as crisp as any other COB, even in color mode. That's all of the negatives covered off. All right, now let's talk about the one advantage that the color light has over the bicolor light when going through the projection mount, and that is how much defocusing range you have. Even more so in the color mode, where color fringing is less pronounced. Okay, let's have a look at how the light performs with the Fresnel. Now it doesn't seem to flood as wide as it did with the monocolor and bicolor light. However, it does seem to spot up a bit more. The barn door cuts seem to be largely the same as with the monocolor and bicolor light. And in the color modes, you get really good barn door cuts. And the shadow sharpness is more than acceptable. Now here comes the boring part. Let's go through all the test data that I've collected. Now my apologies, I only have this light for a couple of days, so I haven't been able to collect massive amounts of data and give you the averages that I normally give you. All right, let's start off with brightness. All of my f-stop readings were taken at an ISO of 800 with a 1 50th of a second shutter at 25 frames per second. These are the results for the light at one meter with no modifier. These are the results for the light at three meters with no modifier. These are the results at three meters with the supplied reflector. These are the results at three meters with the optional Fresnel. And these are the results at three meters with a 19 degree projection mount. Now I've only had enough time to take a few Kelvin readings. 
So I've taken readings at 2000 Kelvin, 3200 Kelvin, 4400 Kelvin, and 5600 Kelvin. Let's take a look. At 2000 Kelvin, I got 1906 with a TM30 color vector score of 91% average color accuracy and 107% average saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0026. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3135 with an SSI score of 81. The TM30 color vector testing results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 102% average color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the delta UV is insanely accurate at minus 0.0002. When I dialed in 4400 Kelvin, I got 4340. The TM30 color vector scores came in with an average 94% color accuracy and an average 102% color saturation. Again with the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is very accurate with a delta UV of minus 0.0011. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5526 with an SSI score of 71. The TM30 color vector scores were a healthy 94% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. Again with the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point was smack on the planking curve with a delta UV of 0.0000. And this wasn't just a once off, I tested this four times and got the exact same result. All right, so that's another review done. Now for me, this makes a lot of sense. The pros outweigh the cons. So I'm gonna be updating my bicolor lights with the 60 Cs. Now in addition to that, I'm gonna get more of them. So I'm gonna have six of the 60 Cs, four of the projection mounts, and six of the Fresnels. Now that makes a lot of sense for the type of work that I do. It might not necessarily be the case for you. Now here's an example of how I use these lights. The back edge and the light down the side of the car is supplied from a Forza 60C bicolor with a 19 degree projection mount. Now the reason I'm using this light is there's nowhere to put the light that is not in shot. And these units are so small, you can stick them in shot and no one's gonna notice in this sort of situation. So for the type of work I do with these projector mounts and lights, it makes sense for me to upgrade because I get that extended CCT range and DMX control. I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.